So at this point, I think it's pretty widely accepted that dirty oil has a negative impact on machine reliability. Now, in case you're unfamiliar with the data behind this, let me show you a case study. Now, this here is a pretty famous case study from Nippon Steel. And basically, what they wanted to do is show that the cleaner your oil gets, the better reliability gets. And so one thing that they simply measured was the number of oil pumps that needed to be replaced. And over the course of improving their contamination control program, you can see a drastic reduction effectively in the number of pump failures. And they were actually plotted this against the number of oil filters that were installed. So we're not talking about contamination targets or cleanliness targets or anything like that. Simply looking at number of filters on site versus number of failures. And you can see that they are inversely correlated with each other. So the more filters you have, therefore, theoretically, the cleaner the oil, the fewer failures. And okay, correlation is not causation, granted, but here is a pretty strong signal that clean oil means more reliable equipment. Now, we actually have similar kind of data from others. So um, I always like these two quotes from SKF and Vickers. So SKF would say that under ideal conditions, it's basically possible to speak of infinite bearing life. And Vickers would say that contamination control eliminates about 80% of root, the root cause of hydraulic system failures. Now, further evidence for this, you might have seen these asset life extension tables. Uh, these are published by Noria and have been around for a very, very long time. So how they work is, for example, let's say I started with a hydraulic oil or a gear oil that is at a, roughly a 2320 18 that's my ISO cleanliness code, and I was able through filtration to clean it up to a 16, 14, 11. Then the kind of asset life extension that I could expect is about 3x improvement in the case of gears and about 7x improvement in the case of hydraulics. So a very clear link between the cleanliness of the oil and the life of the equipment. And so I've always tried to, to sort of say to my customers, if you are looking for a way to save money, then one of the best actions you can take from an ROI standpoint is to ensure that the oil that you are using is clean. Now the mechanics of this, why is it actually important to have clean oil? Like what are the contaminants doing? It's because, as we have learned previously, the, the oil film is just incredibly thin, right? So here I'm saying a hair, okay, I'm not a specialist when it comes to hair, but a hair is roughly 75 microns in diameter. A white blood cell is about 25 microns, right? The, the human eye can only detect down to about 40 microns. And that makes sense because we can't see white blood cells. So when I say that a rolling element bearing has a film thickness of less than a micron, that means that if we were able to take a cross section of a bearing as it was rotating, it would look like the, the rolling elements were resting on the outer race because that lubricant film which is separating those surfaces is so small that it's actually invisible to the human eye. Now, where do contaminants come in? You can imagine that if I have a lubricant film that is about one micron in size, then a contaminant, which is also one micron in size, would be able to wedge itself between the moving components and it would cause all sorts of wear, right? Through, let's say for example, two body abrasive wear, but also it would increase the surface stress and that increases the rate of fatigue wear. The key takeaway here is that the most damaging contaminants are actually invisible to the human eye. So you can take an oil sample and it can look perfectly clean, but it is in fact very, very damaging to the equipment. So then that begs the question, how tight can we safely filter? Because if most of the damaging contaminants are in that sort of zero to five micron size, then it stands to reason that we want to filter as tight as possible. But what's interesting is that I put this question to the LinkedIn community. And if you're not already following me on LinkedIn, please go over there and follow me because I, I'm, I'm able to sort of be in direct contact with a, a lot more professionals from our industry. But what I did was I surveyed over 300 different professionals from our industry and said, how tight do you think it is safe to filter? And the options that I gave them were no lower limit, three, five, or 10 microns. Now, what is really, really interesting about the data that came back was that the data varied quite a bit depending on the job role. So let's take a look at people who use lubricants. They mostly coalesced around the idea that three micron is about as low as that is you'd wanna filter, right? Now, interestingly, people who sell 
or rent filters or who are in the filtration business, they had a bias towards tighter filtration. Now you could say that they have an incentive to do so, right? Uh, tighter filtration is generally higher margin, more expensive equipment, right? And so you could say that there is a bit of a bias there. I think they would argue that there are technical reasons for, for wanting to filter as tightly as possible because it has a direct relationship with machine reliability. But, and here's the big but, right? The manufacturers of lubricants tended to shy away from very tight filtration because they have a concern that very tight filtration is potentially going to remove additives. Now the question is, can you remove additives with filtration? And in my experience, the answer is yes. Right? There are some additives in the system which are not completely soluble. Um, Silicon-based antifoam additives are, uh, are usually the culprit, but there are a couple of others. Um, and they can, in some cases, be removed by extremely tight filtration. And that's why a lot of the manufacturers would say, hey, you know, five micron is about the limit. So what's the mechanism here? So this is what a cellulose fiber media would look like. So this is what the filters are generally made from. Sometimes it's cellulose fibers, which is basically plant fibers. Sometimes it's some kind of polyamide or glass fiber. But nevertheless, this is what it looks like. It's a mass of glass fibers. And what you can see is that as particles are trying to get through, they are captured by these fibers. And so it stands to reason that there is, if there is an additive which is larger than the gaps between these fibers, it's going to get caught. And here is where there's been a fascinating development in the field of filtration. There's a company called Delta Zero that I reached out to about 18 months to two years ago who claimed that they could filter safely down to 0.1 of a micron. And they claimed to be using a completely different kind of depth media filter technology. Now, I'm always a little bit hesitant when new technologies come to the market with these great claims because number one, I want to see evidence of the performance. But number two, I also want to understand the underlying mechanism. Like how is it able to filter down to 0.1 of a micron without removing additives? And the answer that I was given was that it uses capillary technology. Now that's a bit confusing. When I hear capillaries, I think of the, the action by which, say for example, fluid is drawn through a narrow passage. And I couldn't understand how that would make for an efficient filter. And then I saw the images under a microscope. So again, here is your standard cellulose fiber media technology. And this is what the Delta Zero media looks like under a microscope. And so when we say capillaries, it's actually referring to sort of like the shape of the underlying media versus uh, any kind of like fluid action. And the idea here is that under very slow flow rates, uh, it's able to efficiently capture that sort of sub-micron particles. But because the gaps in those capillaries are larger than the size of any additive that is in the lubricant, it is not capturing those additives in the same way that a fibrous system would. Now, this picture is really important because when you look at the cartridges from the outside, they look like any other depth media filter. Uh, you know, one of those kind of like toilet paper roll style ones. That's step one. So that explains the mechanism. It explains why they are a, a bit of a step change from the existing technology. The next thing to do is to actually test it, right? So again, we, I want evidence of those claims. One thing that we did was we, we kind of took a, 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 a standard and well-proven depth media technology, right? and wanted to sort of test them side by side in as controlled conditions as possible. Now, people are going to object that, hey, this is not the real world. Yes, fully understand that. But we're trying to do this in as controlled conditions as possible. So one thing that we did was we, we put them side by side uh, under the same conditions and used ISO test dust. So this is the way that we actually melt, measure filter performance. And so to begin with, right, we put the ISO test dust in until they were at the same ISO code. So a 21, 20, 18. And we made sure, because remember the ISO codes, uh, there's quite a, a large variance in them. Um, we made sure to bias it in favor of the existing technology, right? So you can see here, there's roughly one and a half million particles above four micron for the depth media filter. There's roughly two million uh, for the Delta Zero filter, right? And we wanted to make sure that you know, the, the, the depth media was kind of getting a head start. And similarly across the six and the 14 micron ranges. And you can see, right, after just 73 minutes, there is a huge reduction on in both technologies, right? Both technologies are substantially cleaning up the oil, but the new style uh, of Delta Zero technology has been able to reduce it by another four ISO codes, which is massive, right? Remember four ISO codes, each time you go up one ISO code, it doubles the number of particles. So this is a factor of two, four, eight, 
16 times less particles that are in the system. Now, again, this is not real world. So let me show you an example of uh, a real world uh, case study. So this is in a wind turbine. And so what am I looking for here? I would encourage you to sort of look at these same locations in all, the, all three of the pictures. So this is over 51 days and then uh, after a year, and you can see a substantial cleanup. One of the other things that you can do is try to overlay the photos. Again, the angle is not you know, perfectly the same or anything like that. But one thing that you can see here, this is the after picture, right? And this is the before picture. And you can see that there has been a substantial cleanup in the gearbox. In fact, the, the owner of this gearbox said that they'd never seen a gearbox so clean uh, in, in their career. So that's a sign that it is working in the real world as well. So again, you know, we have these, these substantial claims of being able to clean up to in, in, you know, incredibly efficiently, um, but at the same time, uh, not removing additives. Now, I should be careful to stress right now that I'm not saying that we need to discard depth media filtration by any stretch of the imagination. Depth media filtration is a proven technology that has worked really well uh, for any number of customers all around the world. And in fact, w you know, when I see a customer of mine that is using depth media filtration to, in order to clean up you know, a, a gearbox, uh, you know, a hydro hydraulic pack, turbine, whatever, then I'm super encouraged and I want them to, to continue that practice. But as with anything, uh, new technologies are always under development and it is really cool to see what is actually possible. All right, so, so this is one of the systems. I think this is a, a DX1012 or something like that. So basically the, the, the numbers at the end just indicate how many cartridges go into it. So you can see here, each of these carries three cartridges each. Right, and there's four lots, that makes 12 cartridges. One of the things I really like about this system is the simplicity. So effectively, it's, it's kind of modular in the sense that they've got like a one cartridge version, two, three, four, six, nine, 12, um, and I think there's a couple of 24 unit systems that have been built as well. And as you can see here, first of all, it's like extremely compact, right? So size wise, it, it's really small, um, but also it comes with kind of like all the bells and whistles, but without a whole bunch of complexity. So, as an example, these two little bits are, I think, like add-on units, right? So, um, you know, variable frequency drive, that's an optional extra, as well as one of the inline particle counters. Now, I, for the life of me, cannot understand why um, people uh, shy away from uh, buying these. Um, so even, let's say, for example, if you have a trolley-mounted system where people are doing uh, filtration um, with like a, a, a trolley jack kind of mounted um, a cumulant filtration system. The standard in the industry up until this point has been to take one of those systems, go to your gearbox hydraulic pack or whatever it is, and you know have it filter for some unknown amount of time and then take the filtration off and then go elsewhere. And my question to them has always been, what, how do you know that you've filtered to the quality that you want, right? With, with no data and no visibility, you have no idea how much you've cleaned that system. So again, having like an inline system, a little inline particle counter where you can actually see it in real time. Oh, now my hydraulic oil has cleaned down to a 16, 14, 11. That's the requirement. Now I can unplug and go to a different system. I think that's like just completely essential. But anyway, going back to the, uh, the Delta Zero system and sort of the simplicity of it. One of the things I really appreciate is the way that it has been designed. I would kind of like term this as like the Delta Zero system is sort of idiot proof. So just as a, as a quick demonstration of like how to change filters, um, I will fast forward this bit. Um, all right, I'm gonna unscrew this bit. That's why I have to unscrew it. There we go. All right, so as an example, that's the cartridge, right? So that's one cartridge, that's two cartridges, and there's a third one on the inside here. So obviously replacing them is literally done in a matter of seconds. But just going on to the cartridge design as well, the fact that they package up like in, in a really robust sort of plastic element is also really, really good. Um, you, you find with a lot of like the uh, filtration systems, you know, they might, uh, the filtration element might look a little bit like a toilet paper roll or they look like a combination of a whole bunch of discs. What you find is that in general, those things are kind of open to the elements. So, you know, you take them out of their packaging and if they get, you know, contamination, whether it's water on them or they get some residual oil on them, 
Um, you already contaminated the filter without using it. I really, really like this system because it's very robust. And again, like changing the filters is very much uh, kind of idiot proof. So again, uh, these systems have just been designed uh, so well. And it's one of the things that I find, you know, aside from the filtration of performance, it's one of the things that I, I find extremely attractive about this system. So what's the potential for these systems? Absolutely enormous. You can filter gear oils, hydraulic oils, turbine oils, compressor oils, fuel, even engine oils, and substantially increase the life of the oil, but also the life of the asset. Now, these systems actually have been used for the removal of varnish, right? And varnish is a little bit of a nebulous term because it's sort of a catch-all term for all sorts of different deposits. We actually covered this in a uh, separate podcast uh, that I did with Elaine Hepley, and I'll link the, to that below. I personally have not used these in anger to remove varnish, so I cannot speak to the performance. However, there are a number of case studies out there uh, that talk about it for removing varnish. The way that I really want to see these used uh, is at kind of like mass scale as a you know improved version of a depth media filter. Um, and so I am super excited to, to put a bunch of these into the field. So if you uh, have an application uh, and are looking to try out some next generation filtration, um, please get in touch.